Hello everyone, I am Chirag Thakkar and you're watching Roli Pulse, a digital initiative by Roli Books. In this lockdown, in the absence of books and bookstores, we at Roli have been bringing you these engaging sessions with your favorite writers, artists, uh, entrepreneurs, sports persons, industry persons, journalists, among others, via our digital platform Roli Pulse. Remember, you can check out all our previous sessions on our YouTube channel, our Instagram handle, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. More information on forthcoming sessions can also be found on our social media handles. And if you want us to put out more such content, then show us your love, type in your comments in the comment section below and share this with your friends, peers, or anyone you wish to. Today's discussion is on reviving community traditions of handloom, handicrafts, and textiles, and the challenges of the new world that we are faced with. While the pandemic has heightened concerns about the unsustainability of past fashion and failures of a growth model that doesn't factor in environment and the climate emergency, it's also come at a huge blow to the economy and the global workforce with loss of jobs, wages, salary cuts, and shutting down of businesses. Big, medium, and small, whatever be the size of the business, the virus hasn't spared anyone in this world. And yes, this is a crisis, a global catastrophe of sorts, it is also a time for bringing our energies and ideas together in how to enable a sustainable ecosystem that helps keep alive and thriving of handcrafted traditions, as well as the staying afloat of businesses. Joining us are a very exciting set of speakers, such as Sumita Ghosh, Shilpa Sharma, Amrish Kumar, Malvita Banji, and Maya Mitchell Sumita is the founder and managing director of Rang Sutra, a social enterprise which works for socio-economic development in rural India by both engaging the community and the market. Rang Sutra is uh, owned by over 2,000 artisans, most of whom are rural women. Rang Sutra provides design, marketing, technical and organizational support needed to make crafts and allied rural industries into viable enterprises. Sumita is also the recipient of Nari Shakti Puraskar, awarded by the President of India. We are also joined by Shilpa Sharma, who is a creative entrepreneur with interests uh, in craft, lifestyle, design, travel, food, and the social sector. Shilpa is the co-founder of Jaipur.com, an online retail portal for Indian handmade and design products. She's also ventured into food and beverages with Mustard, a concept restaurant offering Bengali and French cuisine, in Goa and Bombay that she co-founded with Poonam Singh in 2015. We have with us Amrish Kumar. Amrish has been instrumental in building Ritu Kumar, the brand, for the last decade and a half, where he is currently managing director. He is an Aspen Fellow and has been previously involved in a record label and a video content company. On the panel also is Malvika Banerjee, a partner at Bailoom, a store that showcases handloom and handicraft products. It has a healthy online presence and is one of the most popular stores in Calcutta today. Malvika is also the director of the Kolkata Literary Meet, which I also attended earlier this year and had a great time at. She also puts together the literary meets at Ranchi and in Bhuvaneshwar. Sumita, Shilpa, Amrish and Malvika are going to be conversation, in conversation with Maya Mitchandani. Maya Mitchandani is an award-winning Indian journalist with interests in Indian foreign policy, South Asia and identity conflicts. She moved to research and teaching after over two decades at NDTV India. She currently teaches media studies at Ashoka University and is a senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. Maya, of course, is very passionate about textiles and handloom and has most recently co-authored a fabulous memoir of Jenny House Ghost of the Indian luxury brand called Kashmir Loom. The book is called A Woven Life and we're delighted to have published it at Roly Books. A Woven Life is just out right now as an ebook on Amazon. So if you're looking for ways to kill time creatively in this lockdown, you can go order it right now on your Kindles. So welcome to Roli Pal, Sumita, Shilpa, Amrish, Malvika, and Maya. I do hope you enjoy this conversation. I'll just have Maya take it from here and get us started with the discussion. Thanks a lot, Chirag, and thanks for that uh, wonderful little plug for uh, A Woven Life. I hope that uh, some of you go out and pick it up and do read it, not because of anything else, but uh, I know my experience of sort of working with Jenny Housego on that book, uh, it's, it was a really remarkable one. She's truly inspirational and she has uh, uh, you know, a, a nice, very, uh, a very vulnerable side that talks about how she got into textiles and what made it important for her to work with these weavers in Kashmir in spite of her own personal troubles that she's had in the region as well. But I'll leave that 
uh, aside for now. Thank you all for being here. Um, I dare say that I have a little bit of all of your things in my wardrobe. Uh, my Rangasutra shirt, my Bailoon saris, Ritu Kumar Kurta. And of course, in the past, I have picked up a few things from Jaipur as well. Not necessarily the textiles, but certainly on the sort of home furnishing front. So, you know, I've been an avid uh, customer and consumer of, uh, of all your uh, brands. But let me start, uh, Sumita, if it's okay, if I can start with you, because um, we've seen in the last week to 10 days, I would say perhaps a little longer, a lot of traction on social media on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, people talking about supporting handlooms, supporting our craftspeople. Now you very specifically work with, uh, with communities of, of craftspeople. Uh, I, I own something that was embroidered by a group of Afghan refugee women uh, that you sold at Dastkar uh, many years ago. Uh, but you know, the, the question really is that in the kind of economic space we're in right now, some of the people you are working with at the community level are probably really badly hit by the lockdown. Um, how are you being able to manage keeping your community of craftspeople together right now? Uh, and uh, how are you looking to reinvent yourself, you know, hopefully in a soon to be post COVID world? So, uh, yes, we have been badly affected. Uh, although I must say we are a little fortunate because most of the artisans we work with and who are our shareholders are, uh, you know, live and work from their own villages in rural India. Hmm. Some of them are in Western Rajasthan and some in Eastern UP, some in other parts. And for the most part, they are also part-time farmers. Some keep cattle, small and big. So they have other occupations and they are not 100% dependent on a uh, you know, coming to work in a in the in a unit or on this uh, craft. So uh, yes, they have been affected because we haven't been able to work there in this last month. Uh, and going and so what we have done is essentially use this time uh, to keep up their spirits by telling them, okay, so whatever patches of fabric the embroidery women have. You, mot you make motives, you, you, uh, you embroider motives depending on your own uh, aspirations and we'll see how to string them together later and you know, make products for which you can get money and we can sell and, and it can go on. Having said that, uh, yes, there's a lot of buzz in the, uh, you know, around okay, how people will be helped, how uh, MSMEs will be helped, but frankly, there's nothing solid forthcoming from either the government or even the Indian, Indian retail business, if I may say so. Uh, fortunately, we are very fortunate. We have a very good customer, a uh, very good customer overseas. We work very closely with I IKEA and they are committed to helping us, supporting us throughout this so that none of our artisans are out of work and orders are not canceled, etc., etc. So it's a bit of both. Right. I mean, I think that's quite that's quite interesting that you say that, you know, a lot of the people that you work with actually uh, also live in their villages and have their own uh, in, in village infrastructure or uh, agricultural infrastructure that's helping them sustain. Uh, Malika, let me come to you actually with that, because, you know, Bailoom has made a name for itself. Uh, you know, in the handloom space now for quite a few years. And you've been, you've had a successful brand and you've used social media to your advantage. You've, you know, had pop-ups and exhibitions everywhere and you, you know, supply your things to other stores. But in a, in a situation like this, are your weavers in a similar space as what Samitha was mentioning, where they have other uh, means of livelihood, even while the work has stopped? Um, and also, you know, I think one question that, I would ask you is because we were discussing it at, at, at Kashmir Loom as well uh, recently in the wake of uh, the lockdown was that for a lot of small businesses like this, um, they, there's no cash flow, but there's a lot of inventory. So how do you figure out, you know, trying to navigate that space where you actually have the goods, but not the means to sell them right now? First, thank you for having me on this discussion and thank you for your kind words about Bailoom. So I run Bailoom and my partners are Bailu who look after the, the weaves and looms across South Bengal in particular. 
Hmm. So uh, one thing that strikes me about you know our discussions. Let me first answer your first question: Is the what where the weavers are right now in the middle of this pandemic? Uh, you know, there's this amazing story which is of this weaver called Gautam Boshak, Gautam Basak, whose father is an award-winning weaver, and uh, Bappa Ditya, that's my partner at Bailoom, was in touch with him, and he said, "How are you all coping?" He said, uh, "You know, the problem is the public distribution doesn't reach very distant parts of." the the district so i am also creating a chain by which i can help reach food to those people who are at the most distant and far flung areas of my district and i'm I have taken the responsibility of feeding 300 people hmm. so and uh, he's already spent 100 uh, 100000 rupees 1 lakh on this so bappa was obviously stunned he said why didn't you ask me he said you know frankly i didn't think of asking you but yes thanks for the offer when i have to i will ask you hmm. so perhaps uh, the good part of the story is that you know we have never it's byloom is entrepreneurial it is not philanthropic and uh, in that in that drive to be entrepreneurial without being exploitative we have actually made sure that the weavers are not like this but are coming to us like to do this Hmm. to hold our hand in a collaboration to fight this pandemic it is not as though bappa or i are in any better position than them this hmm. covid 19 has shown that it's a great leveler that's so right everyone at their level is doing what they must hmm. now to come to the second part of your your query you know as you said we have a very vibrant uh, social media outreach so we have been in touch with our customers and the idea is as soon as things improve as soon as at least online can you know resume we have to be in a position where our inventory can reach our customers because these are people who are who are already part of the cons they've already been like we are preaching to everyone about uh, hashtag handmade and so on but these are the already converted so we have to make sure that those who who are already our customers managed to get what they want as soon as this lockdown is over hmm. so the first step would have to though we are a physical store the first step would be online perhaps uh, expanding that to hand uh, to home delivery in calcutta hmm. so that you know we have another string to our bow where we say you want to buy this saree you can't come to the store we'll send you images and if you like something we'll we'll come across and give it to you Right. so we have to think on our feet right and that's an interesting uh, point at which i can i can bring shilpa in right now as well because this idea that everybody is being forced to look at even in the creative space which was very much about you know personal interaction and a tactile experience of feeling the fabric that you uh, want to buy or feeling the craft that you want to uh, you know want to uh, experience how does uh online deliveries or how does e-commerce kind of fit into this because for whatever reason i mean this is an area where where you know that that interface has always been important and yet uh, names like jaipur have made a mark but we also saw jaipur having to open a store uh in delhi so you've seen that contradiction and pulls and pressures of the the nature of the product versus the the ways of retail uh, right now how do you see this sort of panning out going forward so you know i think um, i mean there the time is now for all brick and mortar retailers to start thinking about offering a very very immersive digital experience of their products right i mean a lot of brick and mortar retailers have already been on, online but i think now in this post covid era people are going to have to focus a lot more on ai and ar enabled uh, you know immersive digital experiences yes at jaipur we also had to get into you know setting up of um, offline retail stores one in delhi and in bangalore for now hmm. because uh, you know to make the shift between of loving what you see and actually being able to go out and buy it uh there was a need for that tactile experience but i think you know people are kind of recalibrating their own expectations now with this you know talk around social distancing i mean you know walking into retail stores 
is going to have to become you know uh, it's just going to you know have to be a different experience i mean um, we also run a restaurant and we know what we're talking about uh, the implications of you know uh, higher standards for hygiene higher standards for you know keeping your distance in the store so i think uh, you know e-commerce is become going to become that much more um, relevant that much more um you know a channel of choice for people because it stops them from you know having to step out of the house nobody's wanting to really uh you know go back to life before covid right the way it was the way we've known it so i think in in the new normal people are just going to get more and more comfortable just transacting from home and we've been seeing what it's doing to uh, essential supplies and you know how uh, um e-commerce delivery apps are really rising to the occasion uh in terms of being able to bring everything to your doorstep so i think the day is not very far from uh you know when people would take take uh you know the call to be able to buy the things that they really really want uh purely uh, through an online experience and there are enough and more digital tools available now to figure uh you know how this piece of uh, jewelry is going to look on me or you know what kind of um, sizing will work best for me so there's a lot of advanced uh, advancement in technology over there so i think it's just a question of people becoming more and more willing to embrace technology mm-hmm. um you know uh, to be able to make their purchase decisions okay amrish let me get you in uh, over here as well because you know you're a big brand you've been an established brand for a very long time and you're a luxury brand as well uh, for a lot of people so the the question is do you think that in a space where the economic situation has reached a point where people are really tightening their purse strings right now because a lot of people are uh, you know who might have been your consumers don't know if their next paycheck is going to arrive at this point in time so while that may be of course an issue uh, at the rural level and at the migrant worker level there are also salaried the salaried upwardly mobile who are suddenly staring at how do we pay off our bank loan when we don't get our paycheck and if we have to make a choice between paying that bank loan or buying something beautiful uh, from ritu kumar for a wedding or a festive occasion or whatever you know we know where the choice is going to be be made are you thinking of adapting now to kind of this new reality financial reality for a lot of your existing customer base uh, that's one and the second question that i have for you is uh you know brands like yours that are established are also in a position uh, or could be in a position to kind of work with a uh, crafts people and weavers down the food chain and down the line uh, and maybe help them sort of lift themselves out of whatever economic distress they might find themselves in so it, that it's kind of a twofold question for you and that's why i kept you till the end i'd like you to come in on on both these things um well to answer your first question i think that's a uh, that's a question that's that's being answered by all industries at the moment that's right yeah uh, so admittedly discretionary spending is you know at the top of the the pyramid in terms of what gets chopped um you know that travel hospitality mm-hmm. those are the ones and we we are up there so i mean i can i can tell you what um discussions we're having at various forums and with various uh, investors and so on and so forth so the what it looks like at the moment is as you quite rightly said uh, priorities will shift in the short term uh, and also it hugely depends on how much longer this goes on for there's still no real uh, visibility on when we're going to come back so priorities will shift uh, into more immediate um, necessities for mm. consumers that's a given uh i think the question really is not uh whether that's going to happen the question is when discretionary spending will start coming back and the only two um data points if you like that i can allude to is one a lot of people allude to what's happening in china because you know they're probably two months ahead of the rest of the world mm. in terms of opening things up and stuff like that um so i've read a bunch of different reports now how close that will follow india is anyone's guess but it looks like at least for offline retail um the footfall in malls uh is down by about between 40 and 60% that's right yeah uh and i don't have sort of past information on you know where someone in apparel or luxury sits and where someone else sits but i would imagine that uh, the drop in sales will mirror that for at least the next 3 to 4 months 
What I also do expect will happen is that there will be a bounce uh, when some kind of normality resumes. And this is just human nature and, and reflection on what has happened in previous crises. You know, when things get back to normal, there is a need and a want to go back and reestablish normality, for want of a better term. People do go back to spend. Um, but that tends to be a bounce rather than a prolonged um, pickup. So that leads us to the second part of your question. Um, the, the umbrella of craftspeople is, is quite large and textiles is quite large. It starts, you know, at a sort of simple khadi and it goes all the way up to your um, uh, Banarsi brocades in pure silks, etc. So there are nuances within each of the categories. Hmm. Um, yes, post-COVID, there's going to be a lot of requirement for uh, patroning not just craftspeople, but anybody at that segment of the socioeconomic strata. I mean, it, you know, it can be the guy who's doing uh, the tambu work at weddings. I mean, all these guys are under some amount of risk, a huge amount of risk. The thing that companies need to do, uh, and this is our philosophy, is that it has to be a more of a long-term uh, objective because there's no point doing, you know, one season or one little... Um, project with a small craft cluster. Hmm. If it's not something that's not seasoned for the long term, because all you're doing is kicking the can down the road. Uh, because after that season, what happens? Yeah. So, you know, that's, I mean, I'm sure this, this question is going to come up later on in this discussion. But really, uh, when you're thinking about repatroning the craft areas, I mean, I firmly believe that the market has to come back for us to make a tangible difference to what's going on in the in the uh, in in craft areas and with the people at that segment of society mm. what you what you alluded to was something more philanthropic now yes we are doing philanthropic work but we are also doing philanthropic work for migrant labor here in delhi a lot of them who work at our offices so uh, i suppose the question the, the answer to that question is philanthropy yes everyone needs to do it and there needs to be more of a um, impetus in corporate india to do it now whether it's with the, weavers and craftspeople or anybody else in the hmm. uh, who, is a, who is marginalized. As far as textiles is concerned, specifically, I think that has to be a larger conversation about something that is tangible in the long run in order to keep things going. Hmm. Shilpa, you wanted to come in and say something on I this? I wanted yeah. to say something about uh, you know, the overall um, textile and artisanal space. Hmm. Now, in the last two weeks, I've seen a movement, a new collaborative movement called Creative Dignity gain momentum. Um, mm. Shmita has just joined the movement, uh, you know, as of this morning. But basically, the the attempt of all the people, and these are stakeholders in the in the uh, craft space. These are producer groups. These are individual artisans. These are designers. These are manufacturers. They're all coming together to basically to create a platform which is going to address this um, uh, lot of 200 million artisans in the country to give them an opportunity to be able to transact directly off this platform. Uh, you know, at, um, and there are virtual hubs that are being created at a, at a state level and these will further enable um, artisans' abilities at the um, district level to uh, really be able to showcase their product and uh, then to reach out and sell directly uh, to audiences all over the well, country and, and the world. You know, we're in talks with Facebook to find ways to get them to enable this without, you know, us, us and the, uh, the, the fraternity having to spend millions of rupees. Because look, I mean, this um, platform is really a um, social initiative. There is no uh, commission in there for anybody. It's, it's being set up with grant money. And, uh, you know, it will have, it, it, it needs to build that level of credi uh, you know, uh, credibility and confidence um, and coherence for uh, people, you know, em everywhere around to, to support it. And I think this, uh, the one message that, uh, you know, this collaborative uh, movement is sending out really is that this is not the time to do things on an individual level, but to come across as a unified front because mm. I mean, there's so much strength in people coming together instead of one, um, you know, Craft Council of India doing something and Daskar doing something and Daskari Hart doing something else. Uh, I mean, look at NASCOM, right? I mean, look at how much they've been able to 
you know, to, to how much weight they've been able to pull just by standing there as a unified front. Right. And um, what I'm hoping, and each one of us who's involved with Creative Dignity today, is hoping that this ends up being that one unified front that the craft sector has always needed. So again, Sumita, you can actually come in on this as well, especially since uh, you know you you joined this movement today. I mean, it's a twofold question. One is that what is it you're looking or you're hoping to receive in terms of assistance from the government, for example, the Ministry of Textiles has been talking about supporting handloom weavers now uh, pretty much for the last five or six years uh, in a in a slightly more um, savvy way. I mean, I'm not saying that this hasn't been uh, a ministry objective for a long time, but there seems to be a savviness about how they're handling some of this uh, communication um, in recent times. So, you know, that's, that's one part of it. And I think the second is that how do you you know seek assistance from the center uh, and also try and leverage that assistance on tech platforms that are looking for their own ways to also monetize what you might be offering to them so uh, i think from the government there are two kinds of assistance which is uh, which we seek really one is at a very relief uh, level you know as marvika said there are people who need uh, to uh, who need some money so that they can buy their food mm. access to food so uh, in fact one of the thoughts that we had is that you have manrega which is pretty much defunct almost everywhere we work in rajasthan which is pretty healthy as far as manrega is concerned and one could be that okay uh, government allocate some of manrega funds and we see how we can uh, enable the panchayat uh, to make products for which the artisans get some money it's like a relief uh, money and then those products are sold locally for a cause in that sense i mean that's how uh, we started when i first worked started in urmol which was 35 years ago where the it was a drought which started the organization where we did relief work and started and government pitched in to a large extent the government of rajasthan so one is at that relief level and the other one is more uh, in terms of help to msmes hmm. uh, to organizations like us like uh, you know we'll run out of working capital after a bit because if you're going to ensure work for our artisans it means we are piling up stock uh, it means that you know uh, um, the our working capital is running into cash flow issues so softer loans uh, softer loans, um, that kind of help from whether it is NABAD, whether it is NITI, whatever. I mean, that they have to figure out. And then uh, in terms of the platforms, um, you know, again, that's where what Shilpa was saying, that I think also we need to move away from business as usual and this very competitive space that we sometimes occupy, even in the craft sector. Hmm. Definitely in the textile industry and definitely in the garment industry to a certain extent, the export garment I'm talking about, not the local. But uh, we need to move away from that kind of competition where people are undercutting each other to a more collaborative way of working. Hmm. Which is where, okay, so, you know, someone is making beautiful hand looms. Someone is able to ha has a unit which can put it together properly. Uh, someone has the, you know, platform to market it whether it's Facebook or Jaipur or whoever. And that's how I feel that we can come out of this very really in a collaborative way. Hmm. And government has a role to play in terms of enabling that, in terms of access to you know, zero, zero uh, working capital loans, I mean, zero percent in interest or low, low soft loans in that sense to help us out of this. Right. Okay. Malvika, um, you come in on this because, you know, the, the issue of how uh, craftspeople have been dealing with uh, the economic situation now, even pre-COVID. I mean, this is a conversation I remember doing in 2016, right after demonetization, where I'd gone and interacted with craftspeople and weavers uh, and then GST. And they were talking about how there's a different rate of GST on the young and a different rate for a piece of machinery that they may need and you know they were have they were struggling to kind of get uh, get all this going but i think the question i really want to ask you is you know possibly somewhat um, political as well because there is in the in the universe of handloom and textile there is a perception 
about the kind of person who wears handloom uh, and there is a there is a perception about the fabric not you know like like amrish said there's a huge umbrella it goes from khadi to the finest silks all of it is handloom and handloom is not cheap handloom is not cheap to produce and manufacture it's not cheap to uh, send to the market it's certainly not cheap for the consumer who is buying it to uh, buy it and either have it stitched or wear it as it is or whatever the case may be so there is a gap between the the sort of premium on handloom as as a as a handloom product and the perception of the kind of person who's wearing it so who are we trying to target right now i mean as you said you know the the person who you are reaching out to today is the same person who's already buying your sarees right how do you go beyond that uh well just to clarify i said we have to first ensure we are looking after the people who already want us right. and then uh, go and conquer the world <laughs> and as far as a certain type of person buying handloom if i am that person i am completely unapologetic Think about it. Uh, as am I, so don't get me wrong. Yeah. About <laughs> it, and uh, why yeah. not? The person who eats artisanal cheese instead of Amul cheese, the person who buys coffee from some rare coffee uh, outlet is and not Nescafe. They're you know organic, artisanal, handloom, handmade. All over the world, they are considered to be a sign of discernment. Right. So uh, when I was growing up, if I wanted to buy a Ritu Kumar kurta, so that was because I had a certain sensibility. Another person could equally have been wanting to buy a pair of uh, Gloria Van Der Bilt mm. jeans. So these are different things that just you know define the mm. person you are. So uh, that uh, so that the politics of a certain kind of people wearing handloom, fair enough. You know, uh, the great writer Dev Dutt Patnaik always says that the sari is the ultimate power dress. I agree, by the way. I fully yeah. agree. So uh, this well, to answer your question, uh, you know, to reach out beyond our current uh, uh, our current constituency, let's say, we need to the the the, the crisis didn't start. pandemic right people have been wearing sarees less and less it has become occasion wear more and more and uh, khadi and and all the allied uh, fashions which are handloom and handmade have had to constantly reinvent themselves people like jaipur.com and rang sutra have made it accessible have made it funky at mm-hmm. times so that process has to mm-hmm. continue the main challenge with handloom is it's got to look younger mm. it's got to look trendier and uh, it has to speak the language of a per- to, uh, of a person who buys from amazon mm. so you know to that would uh, so that is something each of us has to grapple with and you know the specialness of to use a i mean i can't think of another way of putting it the specialness of handloom is something sometimes we as uh, people who retail it forget because we are always answering that question naya kya hai ah. the beauty of handloom is it is handloom it's been woven by someone by hand so perhaps we have to go back and re uh, educate or re uh, uh, communicate that particular message to a new uh, to a new a uh, lot of uh, potential consumers in a totally different uh, universe we are trying to do some work on satyajit three centenary huh. and the same challenge faces us there how do we how do we uh, reach out to a young viewer and tell him look this man was a pioneer and had you know was, was uh, defined swag before the word came Maybe you so, start with Feluda and you kind of bring in the other stuff through him or something. That's the suggestion. But it could sorry, work. Sorry, your voice. My senior-old nephew is that's how I introduced Ray to him is through Feluda. So we have to find a Feluda and hand loom that will make hand loom look young. We have to make right. Bengal looms find a Feluda and then sell it. Yes, that's right. right. Good idea. So Amrish, I mean, you know, on that point, because on the one hand, you have to uh, ensure that. you are keeping up with new styles new trends uh new uh preferences of the young sort of uh buyer that you have on the other hand 
you retain the sanctity of what it is you as a brand or you as a weaver or you as a manufacturer started out to do i mean there is a timelessness for example about ritu kumar's own designs and prints and fabrics uh, you know there is a timelessness and it and yet that has remained attractive to different kinds of people and different kinds of buyers from different profiles different communities what is it that you think has helped you achieve that i mean do you have advice for other uh, i'm not saying sell your uh, you know company secrets away but uh, but certainly in terms of you know what are the kind of kind of things that you think help in 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 creating that um, that sort of line of that that established line no look the thing is if there's any truth in the world it is that anything that is incredible and beautiful and uh, uh, and timeless doesn't requires you know over a period of time it becomes a fuddy duddy it it's happened to us and mm-hmm. we spent years trying to figure out how to change that where the old textile retains its place so the you know the new customer says they're very beautiful but they're for my auntie or they're for my mother and mm-hmm. we've always we've always dealt with that and that's just uh, the nature of the fashion business if you like it's just different generations behave differently and when that generation grows to a certain age they will start buying these things again so uh that's one aspect of what you're saying but the other thing that i just wanted to uh, pull in from the from what you guys were talking about uh, what malvika was talking about is uh, there are a few key things that we need to remember now when you talk about this um the fine end of handloom hmm. um my personal opinion is we don't go far enough i think that handloom all over the world has a connotation of an extremely high skilled type of artisanship and i don't think that that artisanship merits the price in india still i still think with the amount of time and effort that goes into creating what we create it's still not expensive enough hmm and we've missed the boat somewhere or we haven't had we haven't had a for want of a better term a marketing uh, thrust to push consumers into understanding what this is people who are who have the great benefit like i do and everyone on this panel does of understanding what these textiles is do ascribe the value that they uh, that they warrant but a huge segment of our consumers don't really know what these textiles are so that's right. something that we've missed out and a couple of other things that are important now we keep saying hand looms and i'm going to just stick to that and not the other textile traditions like printing or hand block or dyeing etc i'll put that aside for a minute since our colonial past really hand looms have been developed for the unstitched garments and it's very difficult to find that same quality of thing that you're talking about that's not really ascribed to a sari there are few but by and large we're talking about the unstitched garment i have tried very hard to try and take those and create stitch garments it's extremely difficult mm. and that tradition of artisanship etc was patron for this unstitched garment men's garments that came out of our rich heritage our textile heritage was killed in colonial times men is converted from wearing kurtas and stitched khadis into wearing shirt and pant before the english left so the industry that we talk about now is very largely unstitched garment driven to try and create that into being young and happening hmm it may not work and i i i personally don't think it does so that must retain the place that it has but then we must create a bigger space for it and we must make it more valuable for want of a better mm-hmm. but again i'm i'm not you know i'm not pulling in all the other textile traditions that yeah yeah poor other uh, uh, other brands and other people uh, patron i'm only sticking to this one thing that we've been talking about okay so i mean i know malvika wanted to come in on it then i'll come to uh, shilpa as well go ahead malvika uh what i was trying i was uh, thinking of while uh, amrish was speaking is one segment that has really got this thing as the the credo i can be anything you want me to be is the beauty segment so on the one end you have very low cost herbal products on the other end you have luxury ayurveda like uh, forest essentials presents it so there are some weaving traditions like we have a sari in bailum called the abir sari which is just spun 
and uh, it spun it was mota kapoor which was the thickest cloth and it was one of the swadeshi fabric Hmm. Uh, during the 1905 uh, partition of bengal it was there's a song dedicated to that weave so uh, we have that and so perhaps uh, making it more affordable at one end and like ambrish said having a, a certain certain craft uh, practices are of such uh, evolved uh, or are of such an evolved nature that they deserve to be more expensive hmm. so we should keep both ends of the spectrum are, uh, alive and again what ambri said is that uh, the the challenge of using the hand woven to stitch garments has been a big challenge but that's something that byloom has been working on sometimes with success sometimes with less success so that's another way of reaching out to a new segment so, but the fact is everyone should know that we are trying to make it accessible hmm. to uh, there's no shame in being accessible to people of all uh, economic ability right shilpa if you can just come in on this because i know that you know um, jaipur for example has had an experience with all kinds of fabrics i mean amrish made the point of hand block or printed or things like that that it or ikat it doesn't have to be only um you know something that's been made into a sari or that needs to be uh, needs to be worn unstitched um how do you think that this conversation can be expanded to bring in i mean to to be beyond the limitations of just hand loom but just the sort of textile segment more broadly i think the this is a great uh, time um, and space to start looking at textile very differently right mm. i mean um, i think we're all poised for a massive shift in attitude it, with some of us it's already happening um, some will happen will see it happening and therefore influencing their choices in terms of you know what they are going to buy um, as they grow uh, one of the things that i've always believed in see i don't wear sarees i mean i'd love to be able to but uh, i don't um and um, you know i mean byloom um, product used to sell I mean, just fly off the shelves fly off the uh, website and the one conversation i used to always have with papa was that why are we always looking at this world and this variety through the lens of a sari i'm treating his sarees as textiles every single weave in that store and not just you know at byloom but um the diversity and the versatility of the weaves and prints and textile traditions that we have in our country actually if we stop looking at them as sarees and yes sarees are about dressing in a way that nothing can ever be but the minute we start translating that textile into um a piece of fabric to create something very very trendy i think we're not very far away from a day when it can become as cool as the younger generation wants it to be i mean i think much is going to change even in the fast fashion um space you know all these global supply chains are going to have a lot of trouble are going to go through their own journey in terms of coming out um you know of the uh, uh, you know this pandemic right. and uh, i think that you know um actually our design fraternity should be looking at this as an opportunity to today to pick up the variety of textiles that we've got and say hey you know what we are going to create you know create a line of clothing we should measure up to the style quotient of fast fashion and at the same time be able to retain the aesthetic um, you know and the value of uh, you know our own textiles so i mean there's a responsibility in there for the design fraternity right which, uh, yeah which i which so I, I, final final words from you because i know chirag's already indicated once that we need to wrap up so i'll i'll give you the last word on this i mean uh, there's two elements one is that you know there is a business element to this which is as shilpa is mentioning if we can say that india's textile universe is open uh, for business and it's open to all kinds of ideas as well how can you scale up something like that something like you are doing for example to meet the demands of that kind of a supply chain um and do you think that you know the the, the embroiderers for example that you work with can they be included uh, at, at what level can people like that be included yeah, so we have actually managed to scale up our hand loom uh, and we make hand loom cushion covers for the global market and uh, so initially they were expensive compared to what the similar kind of fabric being uh, made in a mill in southern india but then gradually with economies of scale really 
Uh, and that's where, you know, uh, uh, aggregation like what we do, buy the yarn in bulk, uh, buy large quantities of it because we can afford, we have the money to buy it when, uh, when we can stock it. And then, uh, you know, send it out to all our different groups across, uh, the, across Rajasthan. So I think that, uh, again, this kind of collaboration, aggregation uh, is very possible, but the base of it is really trust. And if I say in Ramsutra, we managed to do it because all our artisans are shareholders in our company. Uh, we have artisans on our board, so they know how the costing is done and how you know how what each bit has a place to uh, has a place in it. So I think trust, cooperation, collaboration, and we can do it. I mean, we have an amazing diversity of skills. Uh, right. I mean, and we're not even talking of, you know, say you have this amazing silk in the Northeast uh, and in the South. I mean, there's so much we have. We have wool in Rajasthan, apart from cotton, of course, which everyone is talking about. So I think certainly uh, there is, we can do it. it. It can be done by either with, you know, coming together as a platform, as a movement, collaborating as different entities or in cooperatives. I think that's definitely possible. Right, and I think that's a great note to uh, to end this conversation on because I think the takeaways from this is apart from, of course, when we emerge from this lockdown and the kind of institutional support or government support that can be given in terms of, you know, zero interest loans or whatever have you, uh, grants to uh, cooperatives and, you know, weavers, textiles, embroiderers, things like that. The idea is to to sort of adapt to new circumstances. You adapt to the new digital universe we're in, you adapt to new styles and new trends and you make uh, India's textile uh, sort of canvas a more accessible to people with different, different uh, sensibilities. Uh, I do think it sort of paves uh, some kind of a direction um, that, that perhaps one can take when we emerge from this. In the meanwhile, I hope, yeah, Malvika, yes, final words, yes. go ahead. I'll just do a quick plug for your book, which is <laughs> perhaps more stories should be written about handloom and uh, how you know various weaving traditions and some very major practitioners you know have brought so much to the story of handloom in our country so Ambrish, you can work on something with your mom and maybe we should have more stories out there i think there's nothing better idea. than a book to tell you a story about something so intrinsic to our culture that's a wonderful idea and then we can all come to uh, the calcutta lit fest uh, as well with all these uh, wonderful books and stories to tell. But thank you all for being part of this discussion. I hope you all are staying safe and uh, staying home. Uh, and we'll see when, you know, we'll see each other hopefully face-to-face, uh, -face, in person, sometime soon. But in the meanwhile, uh, good to meet you all in this digital space. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.